that looks like. I'm like a, about a solid minute behind on the screen right there. And so we're going to make sure that I'm in frame. Looks like I am. Sweet. Now, re-say everything you just said. That's a good idea because I can also probably cut this out in post. So, everybody, welcome back. This is uh, you know, another live stream. I am, uh, I'm excited to talk about this one, but since Logan is gone, this week is going to be a little bit more focused on my personal history when it comes to the whole Genius Brewing business. Like I said already, um, if you guys have any questions on the whole process of starting a brewery or any questions specific to me or what I'm saying, please feel free to chime in. Um, uh, yeah, so going into some depth and how this uh, this whole business got to, um, ex not, not exploded, but got started and got built from the ground up with very little money from a, a fledgling college dropout with uh, one kid and one kid on the way. Uh, before we get into that, let's go over some Genus Brewing news though. So this week, uh, a couple fun things happened. One thing that I'm excited to put out into the YouTube world is that Logan and I are starting a series where we're doing homebrew challenges. Um, the idea is sort of a chopped kitchen style thing. And, uh, the concept is basically one of us goes out to the store and gets a basket ingredients, just like you would see in the TV show chopped. And the other person is forced to brew with those ingredients. Uh, and those ingredients have to be very present in the final beer. So Logan did a batch first. Uh, I gave him, let's see, I gave him uh, applesauce and I gave him raisins to brew with, and he had to put together a beer with that. And then uh, for the second one, he gave me bananas, cocoa powder, and a licorice tea. Uh, and the work for that was tasting fantastic. Uh, so I'm excited to see how those end up turning out. Uh, I'm hoping that after we end up doing our chopped kitchen style uh, brewing challenge that we will be able to uh, kind of expand that out to some other breweries in the area where we start involving them in the challenge and actually do some head to head stuff. That would be really fun for me. Uh, so that happened. We also tapped an American light lager this week, which will be uh, kind of our featured beer of the week here on the live stream. Uh, we also did a um, four barrel batch of a Saison, which we're going to split off and it'll be really fun because we got one going into a clean barrel uh, and that clean barrel we're going to be conditioning with uh, white wine must really fun. And then, uh, the other, uh, Hey, Dr. Hans is in the house. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, and then the other two will be going into our Solera project. So we do a rotating Solera. Uh, we've done it since long before we were in this location. And basically what that means is we're letting a barrel create its own wire wild microbiome, uh, and develop a bunch of bacteria that is going to, uh, um, uh, going to take over the beer and going to create a lot of great flavors. And once those uh, bacteria kind of create their own microbiome, they own that space, which is really cool for producing beers uh, successively on that. Uh, the idea behind it is whenever we keg off a couple kegs, uh, we can basically take 31 gallons or one barrel off of the 55 gallon oak barrel. And then we uh, put fresh wort on top to let it referment naturally. So that happened this week. Um, I think that's all I have for Genus Brewing News. Let's jump into our style of the week. Since we did tap an American Light Lager, I figured our style of the week should be an American Light Lager. And I wanted to choose that one because number one, we also just published our adjunct malt videos. If you haven't checked that out, please do. Uh, and in that adjunct malts kind of category is flaked corn. Flaked corn is very typical of an American Light Lager. However, that can be substituted for uh, something in, uh, the uh you know in the flaked rice world or you know any high fermentable adjunct basically uh but flaked corn offers a little bit more assertiveness so i like to do that in my american light lockers if i want to subdue that assertiveness a little bit sometimes i'll go with some flaked rice to kind of smooth it out and give it some creaminess much love from homemade brewing co cheers um with that uh so that's gonna be our malt of the week i'm kind of rambling these through pretty quickly because it's a little bit harder to do this all by myself because i don't have someone else to talk while i think of ideas i got to think and talk at the same time not my forte um the uh hops of the week i'm going to go with a little bit of a curveball with my american light lagers i like to use columbus or something high alpha and pungent the reason I like to do that is because that way I can get away with using a very, very small quantity of overall hops. So I'm not risking any grassiness or any off flavors. And if just a touch of those pungencesnesses come through, then it's, it's all the better for just creating a little bit more of a dominant beer flavor. So that's why I like to use Columbus. That's my go-to. Summit would also be another one that would be in that wheelhouse. Uh, you have very little ingredients in, Amer in an American light lager. And so if you have little ingredients, sometimes offering just a touch of pungence with those ingredients can help create some dynamic in the, uh, in the beer. For the drink while you think. 
That's a, yeah, that's a smart move, except for I feel like I can't create too many awkward pauses. Um, uh, our yeast of the week is going to be global. We mentioned the, the strain specifically when we did our fermentous yeast video. Uh, it's the same as the 3470 strain, but this is the Imperial version. We've been using Imperial a lot because they are out of Portland, Oregon, which is all of a five hour drive away from here. Um, which means that when they ship our yeast, it gets here super, super fresh and we don't have to worry about, about it going through any hot climates or anything like that. So that is going to be my malt hops and yeast of the week. Let's jump into the genus brewing story. Beer break. So the genus brewing story starts way back when I was uh, a fledgling college dropout or soon to be a college dropout. Basically, uh, it all originated with me starting to get into the brewery and the beer world. I got my first job at a brewery at the age of 21 and kind of fell in love with the beer culture. There's a lot of fun people in the beer culture. When I was working there, I started thinking about, you know, the prospects of my future and uh, going to college. I was going to college for microbiology and a lot of the courses that I was taking didn't necessarily translate into a career that I wanted in the future. So I, I did a little soul searching as a lot of people do. And uh, through that same process, I also uh, fell in love with my now wife and we got pregnant. And so I had to do some very quick thinking on how, uh, how the future of my life was gonna go basically. Uh, that led to me coming up with the idea like a lot of young people do that the beer industry is gonna be the most fun industry for me to be in. And if I wanna do it successfully and I wanna do it long term, it's gonna have to be something that I end up working towards ownership on. Uh, like I said, I'd already been working in the brewery industry, sort of. I was, uh, I was bartending and serving at a brewery at the time. Uh, and so I started putting myself into positions to open up something in the same world. Uh, I got a job at a place called Tri-State over in Moscow, Idaho, uh, and they had a homebrew supply section, which is kind of what they hired me to, to be a part of. That homebrew supply section was really important in me developing a lot of the knowledge for where I... Um, you know, for where I'm going to be ordering things, how I cost and, and do everything when it comes to the, the business side of the world, uh, although Tri-State did not pay very well at the time. I was at the same time working as a bar manager at a place called Birch and Barley, a fantastic restaurant down in Pullman, which I was uh, really, really fortunate to be a part of their, you know, their growth in their early years. And uh, I saved up a little bit of money. I was working two to three jobs at the, sa at the same time to try to build up some money because as a fledgling college idiot, I, of course, had racked up a lot of credit card debt. Uh, so I got all the, that paid off, um, proposed to my wife. And uh, then I had basically at that time about $2,000 in my bank account when I decided that uh, it's time to start looking for something that's going to be a little bit more concrete long term. And so uh, through all that process, I was uh, still down in Pullman, which is about a uh, 90-minute drive from here. And when I was down in Pullman, I would uh, be looking on LoopNet, basically. Uh, LoopNet is a real estate site for commercial real estate property. And I ended up finding a location in Spokane that would do a progressive rent. And so instead of paying uh, you know, an immediate $2,000 a month for rent, that rent started at $800 a month after triple net. Uh, I figured I had to jump on this uh, opportunity because not a lot of $800 a month startup places um, to rent actually happen. So I very, very quickly decided that I was going to have uh, this be where I started up the homebrew supply shop at the time. And uh, uh, sorry, thinking and drinking, right. Uh, where I started up the homebrew supply shop at the time. And we, we moved up very, very shortly afterwards. And so uh, taking a step back, um, at that time I had a $2,000 in my bank account and the, uh, the first last and triple net was $2,000. And so my immediate $2,000 went out the road. Uh, we moved up to Spokane. I moved in with my parents and I started working on opening up this place. Obviously a, uh, freshly, um, we had a newborn at the time and, uh, my wife was also pregnant with our second child. And so being with my parents during that wasn't going to happen long term. So I also, um, had to, uh, you know, I also had to make sure that we had a place to live and, and kind of build a family and grow all that. So, uh, this was the, by this point, it's the spring of 2014. So I opened up a homebrew supply store with a bottle shop and that's really important because that gave me my first insight into the state liquor control board, the bottle shop, of course, being, uh, I'm, I'm selling beers, uh, bottles of beer to go, uh, as well as I had a draft system so I could do things like growler fills at the time. 
So I got my ends with the state liquor control board and started kind of learning that side of the business. And uh, we were building inventory and we were creating a name as a homebrew supply store. Uh, at the time, homebrew supplies was actually a really good place to be because this was before the big Amazon boom. Uh, the Amazon boom uh, taking away a lot of uh, brick and mortar retail stores. Um, fast forward about uh, two to three years uh, and we really started thinking about transitioning into a full-fledged brewery. So in between that two to three years, a couple things happened. Uh, as my parents started realizing that I was diving deeper and deeper into this homebrew supply, uh, soon to be brewery project, uh, they started wanting to become more and more involved. And so uh, when I was kind of knees deep in, uh, uh, into the homebrew supply thing, they decided to start offering uh, some loans, some money to kind of get that going. So uh, I guess the, the first question to answer would probably be, if I only had $2,000 to my name, how did I start a homebrew supply store? Um, when, when I was uh, down in Pullman and paying off a lot of my debt, like I said, I had a lot of credit card debt to begin with. Uh, a couple of things that were really important happened to me. Um, getting all that debt paid off gave me a really good credit score. And so when I moved up and I opened up the first homebrew supply store, I found out that all of a sudden I had a $10,000 line of credit on my credit card. And like I said, being a 21-year-old, sorry, 24-year-old fledgling business owner, uh, $10,000 seemed like a lot of money and seemed like a great idea to use. Uh, I was very, very fortunate. It, it's not a recommended way to do this, but I did spend all that $10,000 on some renovations to the space, which probably only cost about $1,200, and the rest went straight to inventory. Um, the reason I was really, really lucky is because in the very first month of being open as a homebrew supply store, I actually turned that entire $10,000 over on my credit card. That's really important because obviously, uh, you know, credit cards have, you know, 20% interest or something really high. So being able to turn over that credit card means I didn't have to pay any interest. So going through those first three years, there was a lot of ups and downs. There was some ebbs in the homebrew supply industry in itself. I think 2015 or 16 was the first time that uh, the American Homebrewers Association actually published an article saying that homebrew supplies nationwide have kind of gone downhill. Uh, homebrew supplies going downhill uh, didn't necessarily directly affect me uh, because I was still in that building phase. I was gaining a lot of, uh, I was gaining popularity. People were starting to know about us as a homebrew supply store. But it did, um, it did affect me in that my growth was definitely starting to, to limit. And so about two years in, and this is about the same time that I hired Logan, um, about two years in, we really started feeling that pressure of being, uh, of, of seeing that cap. There really was nowhere else we can go. Uh, it's about that same time I also started realizing that the bottle shop having um, bottles of beer and wine or whatever for sale wasn't really working and being the uh, the beer lover that I was I was uh, slowly accumulating inventory so we got to the end of year three and my parents and I uh, kind of worked together on rebranding the homebrew supply store as a brewery uh, with rebranding re the homebrew supply store at the uh, at the brewery uh, at this point my parents had loaned me about twelve thousand uh, dollars to help create inventory I still had the um, now $14,000 in personal credit card debt to help build inventory. And so we had a lot of stuff in the shop, but it was definitely at that point a higher risk operation to, being able, to be able to try to balance this. Um, this might seem really stupid to get into that much debt right off the bat, uh, but one thing that I will say is really important of anybody starting a brewery or a business on a small scale, it's super important to have another job. So this entire time, even when I had employees, I had one or two other jobs the entire time. So I was still able to cover the majority of the family expenses that we needed. And uh, I was also able to hire other people to, to work for me. Uh, even if I'm paying them the same amount, which I was, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to be a bartender. And so I could make a little bit more than I was paying my employees. But uh, it's super important to have those employees there because being a sole person in one spot all the time is very, very mentally taxing. Uh, and that's kind of the issue that I was running with uh, when I was the only person working at the shop the entire time. So one thing that I'll say, if you're thinking about opening up a brewery or if it's something that's in your wheelhouse in the near future, you need to have a partner. You need to have somebody else to work with. And if you're doing it by yourself, don't quit your day job uh, unless you already have a lot of money, in which case you can pretty much do whatever you want. But on our scale, it was, uh, it was basically, you know, it, we had to live month to month 
to build the brewery, a lot of the new, new money had to go back into the brewery or the homebrew supply store. And so there wasn't a lot of money to take. And that flexibility of having people like Logan there uh, and a number of other employees meant that I could you know, actually see my family every once in a while, super important. Uh, and also I could spend some time outside of the business to, uh, I'm just reading Hayden's, I came here for the cover photo. You're welcome. That was pretty awesome. Uh, I spent some time outside of the business to actually think about what I could do. Um, the most important thing that I think I did outside of the business in that first three years was networking. So I would go around to different breweries, different bars, uh, and I would make myself known and make myself aware. Other breweries in the area, knowing the you know, leading supplier in the area was really important because when they needed offhand supplies, they would come to me. Uh, and when anybody asked about homebrewing or, you know, hey, if I need homebrew supplies, where should I go? They also were able to ask me. Um, so, and it's also just really important to be networked because you learn a lot when you meet other people in the industry. I think some of the best and inno most innovative young brewers or newer brewers in the area are some of the best networkers. And the people that aren't doing as well or aren't growing as fast, they're the ones that aren't getting out and networking a lot and they're not making connections with their other local breweries uh, or their you know, uh, communities in the homebrew world. So I see one person said, uh, what was Logan hired to do? Uh, originally Logan was hired as a, kind of an all purpose. I mean, he had homebrew knowledge. He was actually one of my early customers on the very first year of being in the store. So I had made a connection with him over the first couple of years. And, uh, when I looked at his resume versus some other recipe resumes, one of the key things that stood out in my mind, besides the fact that I knew that he was a regular customer and a good brewer, uh, he was uh, an auto technician before, and he was a janitor before. The key thing was janitor because janitor is probably the most important job in the brewery world. And I knew if you could be, uh, make a living as a janitor, then you're going to be very, very handy in the homebrew world. So that's what Logan was hi hired to do. I want the Jean short hatchet story. Uh, yeah. So I, I just, yeah, that's, that's a story. So moving on to year three, year three is when we finally made the transition into being a full fledged brewery instead of a bottle supply store. Uh, the thing that I'll talk about first when it comes to that is how much inventory I had in beer bottles. Cause it was about $10,000. I, uh, I had spent the last three years slowly building up a bottle supply, a, a bottle supply. And, uh, uh, whenever really big, boozy barrel aged things that I knew could sit really well on the shelf came up, I would buy them. So a lot of Avery's Fortuna, uh, Insula Mistos Cliso, uh, Tweak, things like that. Things that are for a 12 ounce bottle, 15 bucks a bottle. Uh, I had a lot of that. And so when we had ended up switching over to a brewery, that was, uh, that was a lot to take home. And I, I drank some really expensive six packs that year. Uh, so let's go into now that we're kind of in the, in the meat of what, uh, a lot of people are probably interested in. Let's go into what happens when you end up starting a brewery. Uh, first of all, I knew that being a brewery and a homebrew supply store would be a really good combined business venture. Uh, I think especially if you can do it right, there's a lot to offer both the people that are there to drink and the people that are there to buy homebrew supplies. Uh, one of the key fe features being if people like beer that we have on tap, those same people can say, hey, how is this brewed? And we can say it was brewed like this with these ingredients. And if you do this and this and this, then uh, you can do something similar. And so that was a, a fun combined thing. And ever since being both a brewery and homebrew supply store, especially in this new location where we've got a full on tap room, a lot of people have said that that's a, a really cool feature. And we're noticing people that come to the tap room, they look over, they see some shiny homebrew equipment and they get interested. Um, a lot of people that drink beer, especially that like craft beer, really like homebrew supplies uh, or, as well, or at least have thought about, um, thought about brewing themselves. And so having that bait right there, something to catch their eye, I think is pretty helpful. Um, but getting into the, going into year three, that's when we really started having to work on licensing. So we didn't, we weren't moving at that point, but I did know that we wanted to move into a better tap room at some point. And so I switched my lease to month to month, uh, at the time, for those of you wondering, it was 2,100, I think after triple net per month. So it's not a lot, but it's definitely not nothing, um, for our small scale. And, uh, so the first thing you have to do when you end up going into being a brewery is you have to, first of all, have a lease and you have to use that lease and your floor plan to apply for the federal license, the TTB. And so I knew the base of my floor plan, but I have zero architectural background and, uh, going through the TTB online, 
Uh, first of all, that's a lot easier now than it was five years ago, because five years ago, a lot of this had to be, be done on paper, and there was something called a, uh, a brewer's bond, and so you had to put a uh, thousand or two thousand dollars down just in retainer to the federal government in case anything goes wrong that could put them liable or something like that. But the brewer's bond is no longer a thing. That was uh, done away with, I want to say, the year that we became a brewery, which is really fortunate. So with no idea of exactly how it was going to work, because the equipment that we had at that point in time was the equipment that we had as a homebrew supply store. We had some 30 gallon kettles, I think were our biggest kettles. We had the, uh, the Bayou Classic banjo burners. Um, but I did my best. I drew up a front of the house retail area where all our homebrew supplies were currently. And I drew up a remapping of the, of the back of the house. We had not very great power back there. We had no floor drains. We had no source of water back there. So where we were, setting up the brewery in the back of the house was a mess. But through the federal government and through the state government, they always want a separation between the front of the house and the back of the house. So uh, there's really no other way we could do it. Um, so I applied for the federal license. Um, I, I had been in the beer industry long enough and talked to a lot of people. Again, why networking is super important. So I had the basics down of how to, how to navigate that. Um, basically, yeah, you need to know things like uh, when dumping your grain, uh, do you have a good source for it or are you going to be end up just throwing it out on the street? You just say that you're getting a farmer to come pick it up, um, which is super easy to find, by the way. Uh, when dumping, uh, if you're not using a lot of caustics or a lot of heavy um, uh, alkaline material, then you need to uh, make sure that you are, uh, you, you're, well, if you're not using a lot of caustics or if you're using like uh, organic cleaners, then you can basically say that you're not dumping anything that's hazardous down. So covering your bases when it comes to that is super important. You also have to be able to pass a personal background check, make sure that you haven't like murdered anybody or, you know, had a felony or even a DUI will inhibit the federal government. Um, but so I went through all that and uh, then the license was applied for there. Uh, as soon as that was applied for, I knew that there was a waiting period. There's always a waiting period with the TTB. For those of you out of country, the TTB is the, the United States federal licensure for alcohol, tobacco, uh, and, uh, that liquor, alcohol, guns, something like that. Um, so yeah, TTB was applied for. And then the next step was to play the waiting game until we heard back from them because it takes about two or three months before they even start doing anything. Um, when we started hearing back from them, that's when I applied for the state license. And the state license is very similar, except for you have to know specific codes to your state. So I won't go as much into even those because there are things like you need a 42 inch barrier around any place that people can drink alcohol. Um, so we got that applied for, got the license changed over, and all of a sudden the homebrew supply store that we owned was now a homebrew supply store and a brewery. But it was still in a very small location. Um, and that's when, uh, the that same year leading up to it is when we decided to start getting our name out there a little bit by doing the youtube stuff because we were a brewery and we were a homebrew supply store and by being both we kind of had a unique leverage that we could do to say hey we have a lot of cool opportunities here and we can actually make beer and have an outlet for all that beer so why not start putting it out into the world uh, the first one i think we did was just a you know, I taught a small homebrew class in the back of the brewery and then Logan decided to put it on camera and upload it. So that was the story of how we became a brewery in the first place. Let's go from the story of how we became that brewery in the first place to now and how we've grown and what we've done to grow since then. But before that, if you've got any questions, throw them down on the thing. I'm going to read through real quick so that we can uh, sell you the genus brewery ingredients, kits, or recipes. We actually are starting to put together the genus brewing uh, ingredients as kits. Um, that's going to be a fun thing that we're hoping to get launched in April. The hardest part for us is finding boxes, boxes that are branded. So if you've got any, uh, any idea of boxes that we can, we can use, let us know if you've got a, a box source for branded boxes. Um, I love having a nice draft in my local homebrew supply. Oh yeah, it's perfect. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing to be able to do both tobacco tax bureau. That makes sense. Now um, it's great being able to both drink and shop for homebrew supplies. And as the person selling the homebrew supplies, if you get a little drunk and you want to buy something expensive, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. Plus I think it's a, a better barrier to entry for those that are just getting into it or like even considering it. They come here and grab a couple of pints and like, ah, I'm thinking about getting into homebrew, but I don't know if I really want to spend a little bit of time getting up a, you know, getting up that confidence that they can do it correctly. 
has the inventory we were carrying gone down significantly or gone up since the other shop? Uh, initially, it went down. Uh, like I said, we're, we started the business with a very, very limited budget. And uh, uh, so it, it's um, we had to trade some of the inventory for some of the be able to brew beer stuff. So that the inventory hat originally went down, but since we became a uh, brewery and homebrew supply store and the new tap room, it's actually started to go back up. The biggest reason is because now we're selling a lot more beer, which means we can carry a higher par on things like hops, on things like malts. Um, and uh, like, let's say yeast are about to go bad or yeast are about to expire. We can actually use those in batches of beer. So we don't have to worry as much about, uh, about carrying a low inventory and ingredients. How do you plan the size of the brewery operation? It seems like you guys did an upgrade with the new location. Uh, we actually didn't do an upgrade with the new location. So the new location, uh, we have the same tanks that we had in the, bull, in, in the old store. The biggest thing that happened between then, uh, I guess, so we had a 30 gallon uh, mash tun and a 50 gallon kettle in the old location by the time that we left there. In the new location, um, we got a second 50 gallon to use as a mash tun and the 50 gallon. Uh, so we have a 50 gallon mash tun and a 50 gallon kettle. Uh, and for, to fill the four or five barrel fermenters that we have there, which we also had in the old location to fill those up, we actually do three or four batches back to back to back. Um, one thing that we can do now is we can contract brew through other breweries and we are doing that with uh, the steel barrel, which is another uh, project that I am associated with downtown. Uh, and that's a seven barrel system. So we can go and basically go under somebody else's license and brew on a big batch. Contract brewing is a, you know, a really good idea for people who are small and don't necessarily have the money to throw into, um, to throw into some, uh, big tanks slash, you know, hundred thousand dollar installs on, uh, uh, fermenters and stuff. Uh, flip flops and shorts are year round. Uh, I feel mo most comfortable in those and, I'm inside 90% of the day, so I can handle a little bit of outside, but I need to do a little bit of outside stuff. But since I'm inside, it's just the most comfortable thing to wear. Did you have to get relicensed with new plans with move to the new location? Uh, yes, that, uh, we did. And the timeline on getting moved and relicensed was about the same timeline as getting licensed in the first place. Uh, I thought it was going to be a lot quicker because, um, you know, we already had an initial license. So I was like, all right, we're already in with the federal government and the state government. So it's going to be super easy to just transition this license over. And it was super easy with the state government, but with the federal government, uh, the TTB, it was, uh, uh, I mean, it was still like three months before we heard back on anything. And so, um, but that was okay because we actually, we got kicked out of our old location and we're here building the new location in the interim. So we didn't get our license back until after the new place was already uh, or wasn't even finished being built yet. It was when we got a license. It was about six months. Um, and so we actually were able to legally brew here before this was legally able to be occupied. We got our occupation, uh, I want to say like a month after we got our brewery license. So yeah, we did have to go through a relicensing. Our best selling product in the store. Uh, that's a tough call. I would say that draft does the best, um, uh, like draft equipment. Um, but that said, I mean, that's if you don't count uh, home, like malts, like obviously we're going to sell a lot more malts than anything, but if you're talking about pieces of equipment, uh, faucets, shanks, uh, regulators, things like that, that sells the best. Homebrew shop brewery combo, an ongoing trend. Is it feasible to start with supplies only? Uh, I don't think it's feasible to start with supplies only. If you ever want to make money doing this, uh, honestly, I would, I wouldn't start with supplies only. It's a very tough business to get into. You have to carry a lot of inventory. So immediately you got to basically lock up $50,000 in inventory alone, and then you've got to figure out how to turn those. So you're, you're locking up a lot of money that you could do. You could use brewing. I think starting as a brewery and building into homebrew supplies makes a lot more sense. I still don't think it's a super good idea. Um, cause it is so competitive to get into retail at all. And inventory management is so stressful. Uh, so, I mean, the brewery side management is one thing. The brewery side is pretty, uh, pretty easy. You don't have to manage inventory quite the same way. Uh, you have to know your licensing and you have to know how to, uh, you know, how to manage your, your stock and, and how to keep track of what you're brewing and kegging and dumping and all that. That is still way easier than keeping track of, you know, 20 to 30,000 different items. We are not yet packaging or distributing right now. We're currently tap room. We have some small outside accounts that we'll sell kegs to, but, uh, we, uh, we're going to build into that. So we're going to need to get a couple of, we're gonna need to get ahead of sales right now. Our tap rooms eating up all our beer. Um, but, uh, once we can get, 
you know, some steady stuff in Bright Tanks. We're going to get a couple of brands out there, but we need to work on our brand building, which is a whole another part of uh, building a business. How many days a week do we brew? Um, between me, Logan, and Tim, there's beer being brewed probably four days a week. Uh, but that's also because we do one barrel batches, five gallon batches, four barrel batches, and seven barrel batches. So we'll try to do two seven barrel batches a week, um, or sorry, a month. And then we'll try to do, uh, probably two on each of the four and five barrel tanks a month. Sometimes we let those ones sit longer. Uh, but we do a lot of one barrel and five gallon batches. Uh, recommendations for a pH meter to start off with. Uh, yeah, if you go to nisupply.com, uh, it stands for national industrial supply nisupply.com. Uh, they've got some good Milwaukee ones. pH meters built in for temperature control. Yeah. Milwaukee. Let's see. Just like he said, Milwaukee, but yeah, I get mine. The cheapest way to get those Milwaukee ones is from nisupply.com. How many people come through the tap room in a week? Um, unique people like unique, uh, unique visitors. I would say it's probably in the 150 to 200 people. Um, it's not a ton, uh, but in terms of individual visits, I don't, I don't think we're at a thousand, but I think it's somewhere between 500 and a thousand. It's kind of hard to say. Cause we'll have days where we have, you know, 40 people in here and it kind of rotates that like we'll be, you know, we'll be busy for a good chunk of the day. And so, you know, on any given day, if that happens, we could have a hundred people through here in a day. I, I have no way of really counting. So I'm just taking a guess. I would say between 500 and a thousand. All right, let's, uh, so let's move on to what's happened. Uh, um, Let's uh, move on to what's happened since becoming a brewery in the first place. When we first became a brewery, we were in the old location. So we were brewing a lot of small batches. And since we were known as a, a homebrew supply store, and we were also kind of tucked back, we weren't, uh, we weren't street facing. We weren't in a really great neighborhood. We weren't in a bad neighborhood, but it wasn't like a, a place that a lot of people were walking through and would notice us. Um, so the brewery side itself, the sales in the tap room actually didn't do uh, didn't do terribly well. Uh, I want to say by the time we ended up getting out of there, our highest beer sales in a month was like $2,000. Uh, but the cool thing was we were still able to get some beer out. We were able to go to events like, uh, um, uh, like beer festivals and stuff like that. Uh, and so we did have some outlets and so we could do some of the same things in terms of if we had yeast, that was about to expire. We could still brew with that yeast and we're able to, to use it. Um, and make some money back off of it in the final beer versus just letting it go to waste. So there was some advantages there, but, uh, in that next three years, sales were really, really hit and miss. And uh, a lot of the times when we had really good sales months, it was because of unique outside factors. So those really good sales months in those next uh, couple of years were things like, you know, a bar would come and need somebody to build out their entire draft system. And so we'd be able to sell them six or $7,000 worth of equipment, help them install it. And, uh, and that would boost our sales for the month. Uh, but the beer si uh, sales were pretty hit and miss. We did a couple of fun things because we were so small scale and we wanted to be able to burn through a lot of batches, especially a lot of five gallon batches that we were making for the YouTube channel. So one of those fun things that we did was a $2 Tuesdays that we did every single Saturday. So every Saturday we would have a new beer on and we would sell that beer for $2 a pint until the remainder of the beer was gone, which was, I think, a super fun idea. And we were able to get through those five gallon batches pretty much in a day every single time. Um, but that said, $2 Tuesday doesn't necessarily make you a lot of money. It does help you get rid of beer, which is, you know, makes it a lot easier to experiment and make a lot of new beer, which is a fun side of it. But in terms of the ROI, uh, we were really after building that experience over anything else. Um, would be cool to see a live brew day sometime on YouTube. That would be fun, but that'd be logistically difficult to accomplish for us at least. Um, would you be best equipment to, what was the best equipment upgrade since moving? Uh, so a lot of times when, when I'm thinking about new equipment, I'm not necessarily thinking about size or production, especially not right now, because a lot of that'll go into, we're going to get a whole system. Um, so a lot of times I'm thinking about the engineering behind making good beer. There's a lot of things that big breweries with a lot of money have advantages over us on. And, uh, with, uh, you know, things like, you know, those hop filters where they can filter in a bunch of different hops and force their beer through it to maximize the, uh, maximize the contact, what reduce all the sediment. Like that's something that you just can't build on a small scale. So, uh, the hop back, I'm super happy, happy about that was a good piece of equipment. Um, glycol temperature control and glycol, I think is the biggest thing. So jacketed tanks, I think is probably the, the number one thing that I would say, uh, for upgrade wise, go start. 
Place for a tap room focused brewery. Is that too large in your experience? Um, 10 barrel system, I think, is a very reasonable starting place for a tap room focused brewery. Uh, it does very much depend on your uh, your neighborhood. So you need to be in a neighborhood and you need to have a lot of walking traffic to make that 10 barrel be a good idea. Um, that said, you're at a 10 barrel scale if you're really pushing your, your capacity. And I think that's a good idea, especially if you want to, you want IPAs to be on a regular focus, but uh, on a 10 barrel size and you're make, if you're making an IPA, especially a hazy IPA that needs to be gone in, you know, a month and a half, I would, you know, six weeks, it needs to be gone. So you need to create some relationships with outside accounts, uh, so that when you make those beers, they're ready to buy them and that beer stays fresh. Um, things like your lagers, obviously you can let those hold in tanks for a long time, um, stout stuff like that, but you need to, some sort of a outside account. Um, even if it's not a major part of your business and you are a taproom focused brewery, I think a 10 barrel is a good size, but uh, you're going to need some outside accounts to help sell some of that beer. Um, all right. So uh, in the next three years that we were open, uh, we, like I said, we had some ups and downs with, uh, with the taproom sales and the, the beer sales. And what happened this last year was we, uh, since we were going month to month, we didn't have any hold on a long-term lease in the location. So this last year, the people that were next to us, uh, wanted our space and the people that were our landlords told us we had three months to move out of our space, which I knew was going to happen eventually. And I wanted to happen at the right time. Uh, but this wasn't necessarily the right time. So I really had to start digging into, uh, digging into what we we're going to do for the longevity of the brewery. And I knew that the only move wasn't something that was going to keep us in the same location. It was something that was going to make us better. So the idea was I needed to find a spot that wasn't too much more expensive. And I needed to find a spot that could serve as a tap room. Luckily, looking through LoopNet, again, that's where I look for uh, um, commercial real estate, at least in my area. Uh, I found a location that was just two miles away from our current location, which is really good because I didn't want to alienate a lot of our regular customers that we had already um, by moving to a completely random location. And it was street facing on the same street that we were on last time. So it's actually, instead of being tucked back into a shopping center, this one's actually street side and there's a lot of traffic going forward. Um, the other nice thing is it's actually right on the corner of a neighborhood. So I have a little bit of walking traffic, a lot of driving traffic, and a lot of people living within stumbling distance. And that's kind of the key in my mind to a place that could possibly work. Um, so, and that has, it's been really good to us being in a, in a neighborhood, especially in a budding neighborhood, that's going to be building and developing pretty rapidly in the near future. Uh, that's the key to having steady, regular customers and selling a lot of beer. Uh, the downside to this was that this building was empty and the landlords weren't trying to put a lot of money into build this build to suit. So we did get some things off of the, off of the landlords of the building, uh, split on the HVAC, um, so they covered a lot of the stuff that would be focused on the whole building or the outside. Uh, we got them to seal up our floors, um, uh, some concessions with underground plumbing and bathrooms and stuff like that. Uh, and then a lot of it beyond that was on us to either contract out or build ourselves. Uh, so that was the time that we were fully out of the old location. It was February of 2019. And uh, so between February of 2019 and August of 2019, when we reopened up, um, it was a lot of just doing construction, running uh, electrical, spending a lot of long days without making money back, uh, and uh, just getting it all put together. Um, we obviously did have to reapply for both the state and the federal license, and so being able to navigate and knowing the laws uh, was really helpful. That's something that I've looked into a crazy amount over the last five, six years, because not only have I opened up a brewery, um, well, sort of helped open up a second brewery. I've also been a part of other people opening up breweries, uh, for, you know, the last five years. And so I want to say there's 20 different breweries that have, you know, seen me at some point or another when opening up their brewery in the last five years. So I had a lot of insight on how to navigate it, which is really nice because when coming uh, to like the design, um, we did get an architecture for this one because there are some things that, you know, we don't know the laws on in terms of capacity and how to, you know, make sure that our lights are spread a certain amount and what, uh, what signs we need and how far apart doors need to be for occupancy. Like, I don't know all that stuff, but I do know what is going to pass with the federal government and the state government. And so I was able to work with the architecture on designing something that, you know, that does that. So, uh, getting into the new location, we knew we needed to be better. We wanted to be obviously a strong neighborhood brewery and we knew there was a lot of, uh, a lot of 
upgrades to the building that we were going to have to be taking care of ourselves. So that, that is when uh, Logan and Tim, uh, another brewer here, um, and who was an employee at the shop as well, that's when they uh, basically decided to invest or uh, I offered them the opportunity to invest um, so that we didn't have to get a huge astronomical loan and, you know, kind of star fall it. Also, they were already very good and invested employees. Um, they already put in a lot of effort and work and create or and care about the brand by themselves. And so letting them invest and be a financial part of the business made a lot of sense to me because I work with them. Uh, you know, anyways, they're my, they're my colleagues, they're my, my brothers in arms when it comes to opening up the brewery. And so they, uh, you know, it made a lot of sense to actually let them be a tangible part of the business as well. So between those two, we were able to get enough money to put together this whole um, tap room that you see here. Uh, uh, the overall build out cost. So we had, we took out a $30,000 loan when we moved here. Um, part of that was covered in uh, paying off our previous, the remainder of our previous loan that we had, which was at the time, I wanna say like $11,000 left over. Um, and the overall cost of putting the rest of this together was right around $50,000. Um, that includes some new equipment uh, that uh, part of that was paid for by reducing our inventory a dramatic amount. So we took a lot of stuff that we had that wasn't moving super fast in the old location or things that we just didn't want to hold on to in the interim, and we fire sailed them. We got rid of a lot of stuff, uh, including a forklift. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we got rid of. So overall, the build out in this location was about $50,000. Um, but now in, as of August, we are, uh, we are open and, uh, we were very fortunate when we were building this place out, uh, we have plans for a kitchen and a kitchen will go in eventually, but that kitchen is, uh, um, it's going to be small and it's going to be very limited. And so we were very fortunate when opening this place up that a pizza place actually opened up right next door, uh, and they make great pizza too. So people can come here, they can have a bite to eat. We're in no rush to get our kitchen open. Uh, but, uh, we will do it eventually. Um, anyways, they bring in a lot of people and they get to enjoy having beer right next to them. And, and we bring in a lot of people and hopefully are getting them some extra pizza sales as well. So that's a cool marriage. Uh, and it's actually very similar to a business downtown that I own where the bar side and the food side are separate, but each of them work independently bringing in food. It does take off a lot of stress behind having to manage and run your own kitchen as well. So originally, like I said, I had $2,000 in my pocket and I had a credit card worth about $10,000. Uh, I took that, I started a business. I um, slowly uh, was able to get money from my parents to help build that business. Now uh, I was able to bring them in. So that's a part that I forgot. Um, so when we originally, between uh, the first three years of being a homebrew supply store and a bottle shop and being a brewery in a homebrew supply store uh, in the same location to get some new equipment and everything like that, my parents bought in as well. So uh, my parents are part of the business, I'm part of the business, Logan and Tim are part of the business. Um, and that's really cool because it means that uh, we've got a lot of people working together towards a collaborative goal. Um, and it uh, honestly, it makes it a lot less, it makes it more stressful sometimes because everybody's lives are on the line basically. But at the same time, it makes it a lot less uh, stressful because not everything needs to be done by yourself and everybody that's a part of it cares about what's going on. Um, my, uh, my biggest piece of advice to those of you that are thinking about opening up a brewery, especially on the small scale, if you can't dump hundreds of thousands of dollars into it, uh, open it up with somebody, with a friend um, that's also invested because having people that care about it and are actively involved in making the brewery grow and build is super important. And uh, also, if you're the only person that cares about seeing the brewery evolve and build and grow, then you can really drive yourself insane. Uh, in the first three years of being a supply store and a bottle shop, there's a lot of times where I was, you know, I was working, you know, 60 plus hours a week just at the bottle shop. Plus I had a job or two other jobs at the same time. And, uh, and I felt there was times that I felt like I was the only person that cared probably cause I, I, you know, I was, I was the only person that was really invested at that time. And, uh, it was stressful. It was, it was tough. Um, and, uh, having, having friends that were involved and having uh, other people come and, and be involved, you know, even on the small scale so that I can have time off to, you know, go, go, go work other jobs partly, but then also actually spend some time with my family. It was really helpful, but it's, it was a lot easier to build the other business that I built originally with two other people that were actively involved from the very get go, uh, than it was to build this initially. And it's a lot easier now here because we've got a lot of people that are actively involved and want to make this business successful. 
So, um, I'm probably forgetting something. I'm sure there's a lot along the way that uh, I just skipped over. Like I said, talking and thinking at the same time is not my strong suit, uh, but uh, that's why it's good when Logan's here because then he can talk while I think, and then I can talk while he thinks. Um, any other questions on uh, what I might have missed or anything in the, in the brewery building world? I know a couple of people were interested in uh, equipment stuff. In your experience, what's the best way to add fruit to beer? Ha, you must have seen that video. Oh, maybe you didn't. I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of ways to add fruit to beer. There's, you know, even ways that we didn't cover in the video. Uh, in the challenge beer that we just, uh, that I just made, the one that Logan gave me a basket of bananas and cocoa powder and uh, licorice tea, I actually took those bananas and put half of them in the mash and uh, at 150 because alpha amylase is actually in bananas. Fun fact. Um, but uh, the other half I'm actually going to take and reduce down into a caramel, like a banana caramel thing. And I am thinking about adding that to secondary, um, but I'm not sure. I'm going to have to see how the video or how the, uh, how the beer tastes first. There's a lot of back end stuff that go into flavoring beer. Um, yeah. So when you're making beer, taste it a lot and then see how it's trending. And then if it, uh, starts trending in a direction that you like, uh, then maybe leave it alone. But if it's, you know, if it could use an extra flavor or something like that, then you can take care of a lot of that on the back end. Did you source and install all the brewing equipment or did you contract it out? Um, well, our brewing equipment is, like I said, pretty minimal. Uh, we did source and install all of it ourselves. If you take a look at our walk-in cooler, we did a video on our walk-in cooler build, um, basically taking a glycol chiller that we already owned and adding a fan unit to the inside of an insulated room. Um, that was a heck of a project, but it was uh, something that we built ourselves. Um, also Logan ran all the electrical in the building. Uh, the bar top was built by Logan and my dad. Uh, a lot of the stuff around here was done by, done by those two. Um, I'm mostly the guy that knows a lot about the laws and the licensing and that stuff. Any suggestions for research on yeast use at the commercial scale in regards to repitching and buying, uh, or buying new each time? Uh, I do recommend repitching on the commercial scale. It saves a ton of money. Uh, that said, what I usually do is, uh, I'll buy a really good yeast right off the bat, or I'll build up a really good yeast. Sometimes I'll build it up myself. Um, but uh, a lot of times what I'll do if I want to make sure that there's a guaranteed good beer is I'll buy a, a true pitch from Imperial. Uh, and then I'll plan out my beers, you know, three or four beers in advance. And so I'll get progressively more, um, uh, basically more heavy beers or more hoppy beers as I go along. So my lightest beer will be the first pitch, and then I'll get just a gigantic amount of healthy yeast. Uh, you can store that, store that in a yeast brink. Um, that's the best way to do it because you can keep that yeast up in suspension with the yeast brink that's got paddles. Uh, you can also keep it in a closed system and, uh, you can pressurize it in a way that, uh, makes it really easy to push out cleanly with CO2 rather than any other like opening something up. Um, so pitching under pressure with uh, a closed system is the best way to go, but yeah, a yeast brink. How is business at the new location? Business is good. Uh, there's still a lot that we need to go into when it comes to like building the brand side of it. And so we've been talking a lot about how to build that brand differently, uh, and make it more uh, recognizable, make it more streamlined, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. And we have, I'm confident there's going to be a lot of growth in the near future. Thank you, portly gentlemen. I appreciate you watching the live stream. Sorry. I'm I uh, I know I talk really fast. And so that's one of the reasons why it's harder when I'm doing this stuff by myself. Turnaround time for the TTB licensing. For us, it was uh, it was less than six months both times. Um, actually, all three times that I've done it for two different businesses, it's been less than six months. That said, when we first were thinking about moving to this location, I want to say the average TTB time for people in our area was probably eight to ten months. There was a lot of people that were waiting a long time. Um, and I think part of that is the wait time for the TTB. And I think the other part of it is just them not knowing exactly what the TTB needs to know off the bat. And so experience or working with somebody that has experience when filing for the TTB licensing, I think is really important. Um, I'm the one that does that, but I've, uh, I've been around it quite a bit. So what do you do for marketing? That's a great question. Uh, that's, that's something that I'm still trying to figure out. I think the number one thing for marketing is networking. Uh, so that means creating a network of people around you. That means, uh, if you know, going to different breweries and being an awesome connection with other breweries, that means uh, connecting with local businesses. Like if there's a near us, if there's things like apartment buildings or hotels or, you know, hotels are really big for the downtown business. But uh, um, just making sure that a lot of people know your name, that when people are asking, 
you're something that's going to come up. Um, networking, I think is the, is bigger and more tangible than anything else. Uh, I don't do print. Um, not that I'm opposed to print, but a lot of times I see a really reduced ROI unless you can put a lot of money into it. And so with print these days, being a small ad in a big publication, I think is not a good idea. Uh, the only time that it becomes a good idea is if you have a really, really clear focus of something that you want to sell, uh, or if you can just be the biggest ad on the page, um, in which case print ad might work for you, but that costs a lot of money. So I think networking is the number one. Uh, we do YouTube, we count as, ad, as marketing as well. So we put a lot into that. Um, and then social media, we try to get on that. But uh, again, there's a lot that goes into building social media. So that's a, that's a long game, not a short game. Networking and creating individual connections is the best thing for marketing in the short game, especially for small businesses. Thanks for answering the questions. You are welcome. When purchasing commercial brewing equipment, how do you pick a manufacturer do you have any specific design and engineering requirements uh yeah you kind of have to work backwards from what you want out of yours out of your system and location uh if you have a location it's a lot easier to work backwards uh, with a manufacturer or with a, an engineer um, to find out what's good for you people like stout tanks they have engineers on hand that their sole job is to be that liaison between you and your location uh, and, uh, the right equipment for you. That said, they don't necessarily know your brain or exactly what you want. So you can start a conversation with them and they might push you in a certain way because that's what they're used to doing with people in your same situation. And you might have a different idea in mind. Um, so yeah, it really depends on your location, how much space you have, uh, how much you're building from the ground up. Like, are you going to be able to put in, you know, three or four floor drains to make sure that you can build out the space? Or are you going to have one tiny little circular drain that that's the only, you got to funnel a lot of your waste down that single spot. Um, in which case you're going to have to size things appropriately. I always recommend, uh, the one thing that I will say, I consistently recommend things that, uh, will, will things that'll make your beer more consistent. Um, one of those being, if you have a, uh, the option of a steam jacket system or, or even an indirect fire, I think those are always going to be better than direct fire. If you're going big, that said, we boil on a 50 gallon kettle here and, uh, that obviously 50 gallons direct fire is kind of the only way to do it. Tavor. Uh, I have not looked into Tavor for distributing. Um, I have thought about getting Tavor so that I can drink more beer, but I also have a lot of beer around me. So that's another thing that we'll probably get into when we, uh, when we get a little bigger right now, like I said, we're selling all the beer we can make. So it's really hard to look into things like distribution until we find a strategy to make more beer. And if, when we make more beer, we also want to make sure that we're making beer that's packaged correctly because a lot of breweries, I think, lose out when their packaging itself is unstable. So they'll make really great beer for the tap room, and their bottling or canning line will be bad, or they'll go through a mobile bottling or canning line, and that mobile system maybe isn't the best. And so the beer that actually ends up in package in front of people across the state or across the country, wherever it is, it, it, sometimes it tastes pretty bad, even if the brewery makes really great beer in-house. So we're definitely focused on growing, uh, making the best possible beer in-house first, and then we'll look into things that get our beer out into, uh, into distro. All right. <laughs> that's uh yeah, that, uh, that, the banana cocoa, uh, licorice beer as, as were, it tasted like an oatmeal raisin cookie. It was, it was really, really good as were. So I'm hoping the fermentation goes well and it'll uh, taste good as a final product too. How do you keep the weight off being around so much beer? Uh, right now, that's not the case. Uh, in the last uh, in the last year, I've gained like 35 pounds, but I'm hoping to go back the other way. I do focus on things like exercise. Uh, I I was a runner, so that helped a lot. I was injured this last year a lot, and so I wasn't able to run, which is you know makes it a lot harder. Or there's you know there's been months and months and months on end where uh, you know I I'm just working, and so I'll wake up, I'll go to work, and then I'll go home, sleep, and then wake up and work again. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't let me do much running either. Logan just doesn't eat ever. He just, you know, spends the entire day not eating and then he'll have a couple beers before going home or he'll go home and have like three or four beers. And since he's so tiny, I'll just pass out. He's a cheap date nowadays. All right. I think that's, uh, looks like that's going to wrap it up. Thank you everybody for watching the story. Hopefully it was engaging to you. If you've got any questions on the whole brewery starting process, feel free to always reach out to us on Facebook or Instagram or comment on the bottom of any of our videos. Uh, we always appreciate you guys being part of the conversation and joining with us, especially on the live stream. I think this one went uh, more or less well for not having my, uh, my partner and confidant next to me. 
if you've got anything that you would like to see on next week's live stream, uh, anything that you'd like to have that personal chat with us about, uh, let us know. Cause I would like to you know draft those things up and be able to talk to you guys in live when you guys have questions and all that jazz. So, um, Outside of that, I think I'm going to go get started getting this place open, and we will see you next week. Cheers. Cheers from Canada, somebody said.